Yeah. yeah. Uh, we are live now, so it worked. Yeah. Hi, team. Well, good news. Hi, Rose. It's how are you? To, good. It's lovely to have you here. As I said in the snippet before this chat, this is the first time that I'm doing this with someone that I work closely with. It's always people that I don't know much about their background, or I just am curious to hear what they do. But with you, it's very different because we, um, you take on, for me, like the biggest, biggest role that we have in the consultancy, which is liaising with um with all the the legal proceedings that come our way and i thought it would be a really interesting conversation to unpack a little bit of that because what i find is that companies in sa definitely need the advice when it comes to legal proceedings and i just thought it would be nice to unpack what are those you know like basic understandings of when you include um you know a legal proceeding how do you start and you know everything that um yeah just to give a, a, an idea of what what it all involves but before we get into my questions i would love for you to just introduce yourself tell us a little bit about your career what you do and and then we get into the questions okay yeah so uh i'm timothy jamond i'm a a uh, labor attorney who has started a consultancy, so is currently not in the practicing role. Um, I studied my postgrad LLB at UCT, then moved up to Johannesburg to do my articles in law, uh, following which I joined a, a industrial relations company as a senior industrial relations manager, uh, while at the same time I worked as national industrial relations manager for a group of companies the CSE group, um, and then decided it was time to start a family and change of pace. So I moved down to Cape Town and joined a attorney's firm to start up the labor, labor division there. And kind of that's where my approach slightly shifted, finding as a lawyer, HR and industrial relations becomes far more reactive rather than proactive. And I think personally, I believe it needs to be a proactive approach to it that kind of address the problems as they arise rather than try plugging the gaps at the end of the day yeah let's make sure everyone's on the same page if we do need to dismiss and that the process is followed rather than being called in at the last minute when no procedures being followed and the case is pretty much lost in its infancy then yeah i hear you and we're so aligned there because uh we see with all our cases if you don't address things the moment they're happening and you just let things you know happen and get worse and get worse and you only attend to the case when it's like in a very dire state then you know that you're going to have to do so much work and you would have saved yourself so much time and um, if you were to have seen what was happening and address it from the word go with you know proper advice and and just being you know like on it knowing that you know yeah you have to follow a sequence of things that needs to happen but it's in a way it will save you much more time at the end of the day yeah i, I think that's kind of 100 percent it that you know the matter is referred or goes further there's there's only two real areas that they look at and that is the procedural fairness and substantive fairness. And as long as you've got the procedure, you're 80% over the line. And then whether or not it was a yeah, fair decision to make is, mm. is all the commissioner really considers at that point. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, cool. Um, great, I'm gonna go with the questions because I feel like that will be really nice to touch base You yeah. know, at the end of the questions in terms of also what happens, what happens when an arbitration, you know, when it comes to a, a ruling, um but yeah let's start with the beginning what's the first question you ask a manager that comes to you with a problem so this is like there's a workplace and now a manager is having issues with an employee what's yeah, the first so in, in terms of that first question really is tell me the story um yeah. what's the issue so a lot of the time because it's employment it, it's a relationship um and because of that, there comes lots of feelings and issues. So a lot of the time, what they see as the issue is not necessarily the root issue. So I ask them to unpack what the issue is. And then from there, you can determine what the actual cause of the issue is and put it into the correct stream. So there's, you know, your three streams of, of industrial relations in terms of, of dismissal or disciplinary action is that you've got misconduct you've got poor work performance, you've got retrenchment, we can start unpacking which avenue it needs to go down. 
You know, mm. is it a performance related issue and is it due to ill health or incapacity or is it actually a misconduct that needs to be dealt with you know, via a system of, of corrective and progressive discipline? So yeah. warning, um, or is it severe enough that it needs to jump into a disciplinary hearing in the first instance? So I think it's, it's unpacking their emotions and finding out actually what's at the heart of the problem. So I kind of like to to just get their full story first so that you can start untangling it and taking yeah. taking the emotion out as much as possible and just being kind of objective in in the approach. Yeah, I hear you. And I feel like that's that's really amazing advice for any manager out there to say when you're when you have an issue, think about it. Is it conduct? Is it performance? Is it it could be business related, as we say, like if you if yeah. you have financial constraints, restructure that will be the retrenchment exercise or incapacity. So it will be one of those four. And when you say, you know, we look at the case very early on, but we think of the worst worst case scenario or just the, how you want to solve it, which is if things don't work out, you obviously really for a dismissal. So when you look at dismissal, there are those processes that you start very early on will follow its course to see through, through fruition through one of those four channels. So if you very early on identify exactly the root cause, as you said, then it's a much clearer process. And as you said, there's a lot of that unpacking that case very yeah. early on and remove the emotions because, as you know, people and dynamics, it can get really complex, but taking it all out and understanding that exactly what is that we're addressing here. Yeah. Sometimes we have seen it's a combination, but you always want to be, what is what really is what we're addressing here and see, is it performance or is it conduct? Yeah. And then I think, I think also kind of the next question you pose then is can it be resolved through conversation you know can we start unpacking it is there a kind of future going forward i think kind of that's that's part of what what comes into it is yeah will we align uh, the company needs and the employee needs or are we just completely misaligned and i think that comes down to as part of that unpacking process, you kind of refine what the issue is. Yeah, yeah very much. Um, and then what I think it's uh, part of that process as well, we I always like to think, is the trust broken? Because that also really defines, it, it, yeah. are we here to remedy a situation? Or are we here to just have really hard conversations that are going to take us. And of course, we are that objective party. So it's 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 really on us to to see to see it in action because an employer might have a point of view. But sometimes it's in those procedures, it's it's more on us telling on the manager, listen, you need to try harder here. Yeah. It's not that it's always the employee, right? Like we are an objective party. So um so yeah. Um I think it, it to me, it added so much clarity, you know, every time we tackle a case to be like, OK, what are we targeting? It can be one of those four, yeah. even though it's the most complex and, you know, like there's a lot of people dynamics and it's been going for a, for a long time. You first get that right. And that will add a lot of clarity to what procedure you need to follow. Yeah. And sometimes and I, what happens. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, and I think it's also about yeah, managing the expectation, because once we've determined what the issue is and which pathway it is, then we know the procedure we need to follow. And that needs to be explained that you may feel the trust relationship is broken and that you can't resolve it, but you're going to have to find a way because it's not substantively fair to, to yeah, yeah. dismiss or to issue a final written warning. It's, it's too extreme for the misconduct committed. Yeah. So it's about finding the kind of balance and fairness in law while following yes. procedure and then and then managing your client's expectations that yeah. you know while you found it to be severe in the eyes of the law it is not uh, as it severe as, as you feel it is i hear you and that usually happens on the in employer side so the, yeah. the person that uh, wants the resolution and they want them now to like actually we need to be compliant with our legal framework and we need to follow a process and that sometimes gets people a little bit like itchy because they want to see it. but the reality is that no and what i find is that when they walk through that process they invest themselves in the process they understand the way of what they're doing right well before it's it's easy to say oh this is not working out you know that's it well but actually there's consequences to that and we need to follow a process to to arrive to that conclusion 
So that's, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I think what there, what a business owner needs to weigh in is the fact that if you buy into this process, you will be saving time yeah. if you are to face the, the risk of it, the, the worst case scenario. So time and resources you're going to be saving if you follow procedure as if you just don't, you know, do what you need to do and then you're facing those consequences. Yeah, um, and I, I think kind of going going to that point, I think a lot of the time, yeah, they want to dismiss and the trust is broken down because there's been a history and they haven't tackled it in the first instance. So they're coming, there's no more trust. This has happened, this has happened. I've said, but what have you done about it? Mm. Oh, nothing and we want to get rid of them. We can't because yeah. you haven't used that corrective discipline that we need to look to apply. You know, yeah. if it's not a severe misconduct, you need to try correcting the behavior. And behavior is correctable. Um, it's a process that that does work, but it needs to follow a process. Yes, I hear you. So there's some undoing that needs to happen to be like, okay, I understand you've been dealing with this for a while, but not necessarily following the process. So now you need to kind of start from from the from scratch. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, the advice there is the moment you have something that's itching at work, if you're a manager or a business owner, then in Get, get to understand what's that legal proceeding that you need to follow in order to to really align, right? That's what you're looking for. And if it doesn't work, it will end up in a, in a, you know, something will happen. We have some stats there, by the way, from the consultancy where we find that 5 to 10% of your workforce on a weekly basis is misaligned to your company. And that could be in the form of, sentiment you feeling negative towards your employment because you know you there's a project that uh, you didn't like how you work with your colleague or you know all the things that can bring negative emotions and if you don't address them on that frequency weekly you know and then it becomes an issue like the ones that that we get called in like rose you know team this is not working out the performance is not there and all of that if it gets to that point you have a 65 percent probability of that person leaving your company or you having to dismiss them so it's quite a high probability the moment you get to speak to us there's a 65 percent chance that person is not going to be in your business it's going to take about two months you know one to two months for, for that to happen because we need to follow a process but what that tells you is that that misalignment from the beginning is expensive if you just let it happen without uh, addressing it so those are quite cool findings and the way we got to those findings is because we um, we know how many legal proceedings we have initiated and what were the outcomes of them, right? So that's that's how we got to that number. And then on, on this kind of like proactive nature of what we are trying to do, I'd love you to explain to the audience how um, policies help also from the word go, because this is something that particularly maybe Cape Town, I don't know, but uh, companies are like, do I need to have policies or we don't have this in place? So how do they help having a policy booklet with, with what specific policies do you like to see that helps your work uh, to be more efficient? Yeah, so I think, I think policies and procedures are key. You know, uh, contracts, create, you know, your employment contract creates that, that reciprocal relationship between the parties. But the policies and procedures help guide it. Um, so effectively, it allows to put the building blocks in place that the company can use and the employee can use. They've got something to fall back on. There's a clearly defined parameters of what's expected, how it's expected. You can then also help to enforce certain small measures of discipline. Um, so, you know, uh, a smoking policy, for example, will define where you can smoke. And in fact, it's a requirement by law that you have it. So if the Labor Department comes knocking on your door to do a labor audit, they will check certain things are in place and there's certain policies by law that you have to have in place. Um, you also find that it helps give security to the employees, not only knowing, as I say, the box, but you'll have your grievance proceedings. So they may be feeling that they're being abused by a manager, not know where to turn, but there is actually a mechanism for them to raise it in a safe, open way where they won't be persecuted for it or they shouldn't be. Um, so I think yeah, they, they really are key in, in helping to define the parameters of what the company expects. It's the same as kind of putting in your key performance indicators 
that are objective rather than subjective. It just helps the employee know what that minimum expectation is and what what the playing field of their work situation environment is. Uh, I, the playing field, that's exactly how I see it. It's like if you're going to a soccer match, you know there's rules that you need to follow. Like you have a perimeter, you know, where you play the match and you know what a goal means. You know? So if you at the workplace, if you don't if you don't have that idea of how to play that game, to say, you know, using the, the metaphor, you can't go really wrong. Like assuming that you're aligned just because you like the person, it's it's so um, you know, like far-fetched ideal but far-fetched like you actually need to tell people what's cool what's not cool yeah. and, and there's certain things that you know from a legal framework and i always say you know when we do inductions you don't have to read the employee handbook it's 60 pages i'm not going to ask you to take you know two hours of your time bedtime to read the handbook but when you do have an something that that you're experiencing go and check what policy can you relate to because it will give you an idea of how the company sees this uh, situation so yeah. like for example the code of conduct and um, dress code how do we behave in social functions like a lot of things that you know a business tells how you need to represent so it gives you an idea of how to align and yeah. when it comes to us doing our legal proceedings most of the charges to say in a way for like a council incision it would come down to was there a policy in place that outlines how this needs to be handled and, and we align with that so that's also um from a procedural point of view it's more effective when you have a policy if you don't have a policy we'll actually go and have to draft it based on the situation that you face because we don't want to see a repeat of the same right so yeah more proactive yeah. To have it in place yeah as you say it's a proactive nature so rather than let i mean you just take a, a simple example of timekeeping um yeah, sure, it's, it's a misconduct. But if you have a policy stating if you're going to be late, if you're more than 20 minutes late, you need to let the people know 10 minutes before work. And let's say it's a call center environment, someone's got to cover for you. It allows the company time to, to manage that process. But rather than let it become kind of a, a habit in the company that people arrive 10, 15 minutes late, you can address it. And it's, it's a minor infringement that you can just slowly use to correct behavior. Um, it also, because it's not part of the employment contract, it it's much easier to change. It's at the company's discretion, effectively. So all they need to do, they need to make amendments. It allows the company to remain much more flexible in that regard. They'll send out a notice, we're changing this policy to read that. And that's why you review policies. It's not just a yeah. one document fits all. It's yes. tailor-made for the company, which industry it's in, uh, are there any sectoral determinations that have to be considered in terms of, of shift roster management, uh, work schedules, night work, all of that can then be fitted in and tailored to the company's needs? Yeah, yeah, 100%. I also have an example with um, lead management. Like the, I deal with co some companies that they, they, they're just chill. They don't want lead management. People can take time off when they want to take time off, right? And that's that's a beautiful kind of like um, way to want to about things. But then what happens is that employees are so like, they don't take the lead and then they don't know how much they have. And then it be, it's counter, you know, to what you actually want to instill, which is a relaxed atmosphere. Now you have people where they're overly stressed, they're not taking the time off, they don't have any clue if they're allowed to or not because it's not defined. So when you start with that kind of really relaxed mindset, you can actually have the opposite effect because you're not giving people guidelines and we work well with guidelines. So yeah. that's another example of how a policy can can help. Um, yeah, and so I, also, I, I was yeah. just going to say, I mean, to to that point again, I think I think that's exactly it. It's, it's the same way you build a company effectively and to build a successful company you put in place building blocks that help define your strategy where you're going and how it's going and i think as people and employees we want those perimeters defined you don't want to go to work and say i don't really know what i'm meant to be doing or yeah i know i've got to hit this target but how or i don't know when i can go have a smoke i don't know where my lunch breaks are um yeah. And all of those can create that level of anxiety that ramps up. You want it yes. to be relaxed, but you still want discipline in the workplace. Because if you don't have it, 
and people doing what they want. The company doesn't get the, the desired product either, the outcome. Um, and you said the sentiment of just take time off when you need time off. Let's not, let's not govern it properly. Yeah, part of the issue you have, if you don't have it in your contract and in a policy that actually your leave gets forfeited after a certain period, that can accumulate. So you can have a person who's worked at the company for a number of years who has technically never taken leave, even though they have, and now they are leaving the company. You've yeah. got to pay out leave days and they've got 20 days. So effectively, you're paying them for another month. Yeah, no, exactly. I feel like it has the completely opposite effect of what people, you know, may think why we don't want, you know, policies in place. And I think specifically in the in the Cape Town start, startup landscape, that is, you know, the, the intention, you know, we're yeah. starting, we're all doing. But actually, when you give the, the more guidelines you give, uh, it, it really makes people feel reassured. I think it's human nature. It really yeah. is. It, you it might think that we crave. Yeah. And, and you might have even, you know, very creative roles that you want to give them a lot of freedom. And that's OK, you know, but I think there's there's a point in the business where these things need to be discussed. It's not it's almost immature not to do it. So as a business grows, they tend to realize these things. And then that's when they need more of the HR help. But our advice here is like start with it because then you start slow and, you know, with a minimum and you build from it. And that's a much more um, efficient way to to grow the business. And there's also something that I wanted to touch base with you in terms of probationary period, because I feel like that we have had a lot of questions related to this lately. Yeah. And when we look at the legal framework, we know that we can do probationary periods of three months. You can extend for another three months. But when things go wrong during this probationary period, um, I, I, want you, I want you to explain this to the audience, because people will think, Okay, three months probationary period. It actually didn't work out. I don't want this person, you know, permanent. And then they think, what do we do? We just say bye, three months, and that's it. Do we issue a letter? And what's your advice when when someone comes to you with that question? Yeah. So I mean, the probationary period is a, a misnomer in many senses, because many people think it's it's as you say, uh, you know, the ability that it's not working out. We're just going to terminate the contract it doesn't work that way you yeah you know, they are permanently employed and because they're permanently employed you have to follow the legal procedure as it's set out mm -hmm. so there's a different onus on it so you can dismiss for for less serious misconducts maybe less guidance that needs to be given in terms of a poor work performance that you don't have to give all the opportunities or consider all possible alternatives but those procedures still have to be followed because a person is permanently employed and therefore they are protected by the Labor Relations Act. Um, and what you need to do is just make sure that you follow the correct procedure. As I said, yeah, that procedure is key in terms of anything. If it does go worst case scenario, there's a dismissal and they take it to CCMA. Um, that covers a, a large portion of what a commissioner will make a judgment on will be the procedural element of it and that's that's where the majority of people fall down that they mm -hmm. think oh look it's not really working out or you you're not a good personality fit for us uh we're not going to extend your probation we're going to cancel the contract at that point you've already lost yeah i hear you and and I think that uh, that awareness that, OK, you're in probation, but it means that if you're seeing something that's not right, you still need to follow one of the routes, the legal routes, conduct, performance, incapacity, or, well, the, the business side, retrenchment, if, if you do, do not see this person being in your business any longer. And that might take longer than the three-month probationary period. And then you need to extend. But what happens is that, let's say, because we always look at the worst case scenario, if you are to end up at CCMA, what the commissioner would say is, uh, business, show me how hard you try to align with this person. And yeah. when you don't have the many times that you tried because you didn't, then the worst case scenario is that the person gets reinstated because you're not, you don't have anything to show for, you know, trying hard to remedy the situation. Yeah. So that's another piece of awareness that at the CCMA, you know, we look at worst case scenarios and usually it's like a payout package, right? That that you would think is the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is reinstatement. 
um, and then having to actually be like, okay, we didn't do things right the first time around. We need to try harder. And now this person is back in your business. So with all that history that you already have, you can only imagine how the person feels, how colleagues, how much confusion. And it just shows that uh, you did not, to me, maturity. That That's really what it comes down to. Yep. Feel like Look, people, yeah. yeah. And, and I, was, I think that, that that's exactly it, is that, yeah, the the worst situation is is where it often comes up with probationary periods is is around performance, and in terms of the performance, you still have to try getting that employee to the required standard. You have to show what training you gave, what guidance you gave, what assistance you gave, how you helped them to try reaching that standard, and then if they don't reach that standard, you say, is there another role for them? Can we adjust? And as I said, the onus is less. But it still exists. And that largely what happens in a probationary period. I think, yeah, if it's a misconduct, you follow the misconduct procedure. And depending on the severity of it, it it's a much, much cleaner case. Yeah. I hear you. Um, and then what, what, one of our biggest findings, I would say as well, is that when you go through that process of like showing, like having a manager have to give guidance to a person so that they can perform to the expectation required, you find that that there's there's sometimes like um, it's hard for a manager to ex to say exactly what the expectation is. So if you sit in that environment, which is very focused on doing that, you can only imagine how it can how it goes when these two people are working, you know, on the day to day. So it's another of the findings from this um, frequent feedback that we encourage managers to do is that actually managers shy away from the hard conversation and yeah. then they don't say it and things go and say it and then you have these blow up cases so it really is all about how you are um as a manager uh creating that um expectation of what's required and when it is not being met how you are saying you know this is not being met because that is what's going to give you a successful or not case at the yeah. end of the day and for me, it's about following in that formal process that we put it in a neat little package box of saying, yeah, because because what hap often happens is it's tried being done kind of on the fly and quite quickly that, listen, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, no records really kept of it, and there's nothing concrete. It's often the case yes. that, again, you go back to your, your KPIs, that KPIs haven't been properly explained or properly set because uh, it's difficult to do. Um, this is often the case and how do we calculate it the problem is is you want it to be objective you can't dismiss someone on a subjective basis yeah. saying i don't really think you're hacking it uh, yeah. but why don't you what what are you backing that up what empirical yeah. data or evidence are you trying to use what metric are you trying to use yeah. so the idea of where it's difficult to do try getting a scoring metric on it that mm -hmm. this is how we're going to look to do it there's this many failed attempts are acceptable, this many are not. Yeah. Or this many yeah, exactly. poor interactions. And you try kind of getting a scoring grade that you standardize as much as possible across the board. And that then also gives employees in a probationary period, incoming employees, a framework and a target of where to aim and what to go for. Um, yes. And then if they're not meeting it, you've got your weekly reviews or you know, bi-monthly reviews or monthly reviews with them where you say, listen, this is a scorecard. This is where you're falling short. This is what we expect of you. How can we assist you to get there? You know, do we need to train you on, on the CRM system again or whatever it might be? And yeah. during that process, they, yeah, we start proving whether or not the employee actually has capacity to fill yeah. the role and is able to do the job that's required of them. Um, yeah. So again, it's, it's just about going back to the policies and procedures and and the boxes that we create and that help the company run and work. Yeah. Uh, that's what creates successful organizations. The problem is, is if they're allowed to slide, it can become toxic in nature. Mm. Um, and, and you kind of need to avoid that because rectification of that when the culture changes or you know, if they're not in place from the onset, you'll get that change from startup, garage, moms and pop shop business to when they need to go more corporate, a lot of the people who started with you start falling away because they can't handle the change into a more formalized system. So mm. it's good to have that, that structure in place, even if you handle it more loosely, that structure's there that you can start then rectifying much more readily. Mm. Yeah, 100%. 
I do find that a lot of the, you know, when, um, when someone comes to with an issue uh, to us and you start unpacking the case and you start following the procedure, I really do find that management not having a feel the person is not working out but not knowing how to prove it it's mm. it's really big in in how we build cases and we have an example of this of there was this role someone not working out on a quite a senior role and the way we had to what well, we had to bring it down to is how many that the time that it takes the person to reach the outcome how many times did they, t- they touch base with um someone else in order to achieve that outcome. And then, you know, we, we got like, there was like 30 calls in a week or, you know, something like very excessive. So to say, you know, that person achieved the outcome, but they needed so much help that it actually tells you that it's not up to the efficiency required for the business. And for that manager to reach that conclusion that that feeling that they had, the person is not there, it actually had to do with the fact that you know, the outcome was there, but then there were so many, uh, you know, interactions and things that needed to happen for this person to perform to that level required. That was the understanding that the manager couldn't necessarily articulate, but through the process we could. And then it's quite clear when you expose a case to say, cool, you reached the outcome, you took a week longer to do it, and you had so much input from, you know, uh, uh, this particular role, then actually the person understands, okay, now I see your point. Now I see what you mean, I'm not aligned to you and my ex- the expectation is, is not there. Because also what managers fail to realize is that they have a more of an arts um, bird's eye view on the team because they know how everybody's doing in the team. Yeah. But as a person, you can't benchmark yourself against other people. It's, it's difficult to know what other people are working on and how managers are perceiving them. So that's also part of this work to make sure that people understand they're part of a, a unit, an ecosystem, and they're actually pulling forward or actually pulling backward that ec- ecosystem. So yeah. that is also part of that that work. Um, I'd love to know from your point of view, what's the what's the best piece of advice you would give a founder when it comes to the SA legal framework to work with it? I think it's to trust uh, trust the process. I think that. The Labor Relations Act has given us a clear set of guidelines. Um, you know, there's some, mine, you know, it, it's a bit of a minefield, but there's a path through that minefield if you know the procedure and you just have to trust it. And you will get the desired outcome. Either, yeah, if the employee, if there's misconduct or they're not performing, you start the process. You follow the process and they either meet the expectation they change their pattern of behavior, they stop committing the misconducts, or they don't, and ultimately they leave the business. Um, either because they get fed up with, with trying to conform, or they don't kind of fit in with the environment, or they realize that, hang on, this isn't the role for me, or yeah, they get dismissed. Yeah. Um, but there is that process, and I think the key piece of advice is trust the process. It does work. It may feel that it's against you, but it's actually there because of, yeah, it, it brings fairness and equality. You look at um, the US, for example, in many of the states where you can dismiss as and when you will. It, there, there is no job security in those those kind of settings. Um, yeah, talk about, about kind of terrible, terrible cases. I know during the... I think it was 2008 uh, economic crash in the UK, uh, the US, the global bubble burst. Um, when they're doing mass scale retrenchments, the one. Uh, um, e card works, you're still employed. If it doesn't work, you no longer have a job, we'll FedEx your content of your desk to you. Um, and I think uh, that's why we have that legal framework to stop that kind of abuse, I suppose. Um, yeah, I agree. But yeah, you, and, you, you've and just I, got to trust the process. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think in, in SA, um, the, the legal framework is, is very well respected and almost like feared to say it in a way because it is very um, it's, uh, it's well furnished to say it in a way. And I find that um, when you take time to study, to learn it, or to get advice from it. 
it's actually a beautiful framework to work with because when you follow a process, as you said, when you trust the process, outcomes take place, but it gives so much dignity in the process. Because as you said, if you work with a legal framework that you can just say, listen, you're fired and that's it. What can that cost to your, you know, to, to you as a person? And also, how did you actually come to terms with this? Because is the person explaining the reason why? And if then you think, okay, am I, you know, not up to the level required? What's the reason why? So what the essay legal, legal framework provides you is with a thought process you need to take the person through. So they arrive with you to the conclusion that this is not working out for them. And that process of understanding why it's not working, it's going to be better for them when they go into their next thing. So and I think it, it, it gives dignity. That's, that's really what, to me, it comes down to. It's hard to go through these processes. You never wish it on anybody, but you know that people are going to be better off after they go through the process, as opposed to something that can be so like, you know, like, you know. It's, it's, so, uh, it's so hard and harsh. I don't like you, you're fired. It, it's not that. It's, yeah, as, as you kind of, you had mentioned and alluded to, as you study it, you, you realize that it's a good system. It's a good system because it's actually, in its very nature, is quite a simple system. What makes it complex is the human emotion that comes with it and potentially the complexities of each individual case. The process is is fairly clear. Um, and I think, you know, going to the process, another piece of advice I'd, I'd give them is that, you know, you don't have to commit, you know, give a, a verbal warning, a written warning, a final written warning before you can go to dismissal. Yeah, it depends on the nature of the misconduct. I think lots of people misunderstand that and think that it has to be a three-strike policy for each and everything, whereas they're, they're related misconducts. And yeah, yeah, all of that can be bundled together quite nicely because it's clearly defined. And then again, yeah. it goes back to your policies and procedures. We've outlined what we believe misconducts are. We've outlined what the appropriate sanction for those misconducts are. So there's a guideline about what you can do and what you can't do. And that's why you kind of, during an induction, you help them with understanding and training of it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I feel like um, when you're used to working with the legal framework, you know what you're doing and you you have done a few of those processes. It comes to a point where, um, like, for example, when it comes to the, 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 the severity of the warning, right? You know, this understanding of six months, 12 months, verbal, written, which, which one do I do? There's a point where you almost like read these processes and intuitively you know if this is a verbal or a written because you know the effects that it had. And when, when you have these talks with people, then that, that conversation, the weight of the conversation is different because you're it's substantiated. And, and so I, I guess it really all comes down to having those conversations. And those conversations can be with your HR, can be with a legal attorney, can be on your own because you're used to having them and you know the legal framework, so you can have them on your own. So, um, so yeah, I guess it's, um, again, weighing from a business point of view, n deciding not to do these things as opposed to actually uh, taking the time to, it will definitely pay off in the long run that, um, you know, from an efficiency point of view as well, not only for, for you know, giving dignity, which I think it's already a, a big thing, but also it makes sense from a business point of view to, to do them. Yeah. And now let's talk about what happens when you actually get to CCMA, because I think people also like to know about that. Uh, let's yeah. say the employee was disgruntled and they take you to CCMA. Anybody in SA, can take you to even not not dismissed you know like unfair legal process and people can take you to ccma so people uh, business owners fear i guess fear that what happens when someone takes you to a ccma yeah look i, I think lots of people do fear it. it it's kind of the the boogeyman as it were who's standing there and, and i'm going to take you to the ccma it's, it's nothing to be scared of again it goes back to the trust the process if you've done nothing wrong and you have your facts in order, it will be proven. Um, and yeah, even if you're fairly dismissed, even if the person's not dismissed, as you said, they can refer it for unfair labor practice to the CCMA. All that happens is normally it'll be set down. They don't even look at the merits of the case. So it'll be set down for a con op, which is conciliation, followed immediately by arbitration. Um, depending on the, on the matter, you'd normally just say, yeah, 
if it's unfair labor practice, follow the con arb process. It'll normally be settled in conciliation. The arbitration, what's the worst case scenario is we remove a, a written warning. Um, so it all it all depends on the nature of the matter. But yeah, say it's for dismissal, depending on the complexity you want to find out, are, are we going to conciliate? Are we going to find a middle ground in a settlement or are we not? And if not, then you, you go to arbitration. And you know, commissioner will only really look at two things. They will look at procedural fairness and substantive fairness. Now, substantive fairness is subjective. So they normally will look at, at fairness in that aspect, but that actually only forms about 20% of what they look at. The main thing that they look at is procedure. Because if you fail on the procedure, you've got an award coming against you no matter which way. Um, so as long as you, again, trust the legal process and follow the correct process and procedure, you're 80% of the way there. So when you go to CCMA, it's nothing really to be scared of. It's we follow the procedure, we believe it to be fair. Yeah. And you stand by that that statement. I hear you. Um, so yeah, so one of my learnings with CCMA is understanding the difference in between conciliation and arbitration. And conciliation being the very first stage where it's actually not about, you don't unpack the case. You just, the commissioner wants you to come to terms, to see if there's a way to, to come to terms. So there's usually a negotiation for that to happen and a package to be negotiated. So yeah. it's, you know, how much does the employer is willing to go? And what the employer might think at that stage is like, yeah, we have a fair case with everything that we have to do. I don't want to have to settle, right? So if that is the case, or they might think, I'd rather settle. I don't want any more time spent in these things. So then they settle. Yeah. And and the employee will have other motivations to settle. And they will they will bring to their case and not necessarily what happened that build a case. They will bring their personal circumstances, the reason why they cannot not have a job. And so it's a very, you know, like um it's a pro it's it's quite a meeting that you have where where it's all goes out. So if you did not unpack that in, in your previous process, it's going to come in that mediation and you will expect to somehow make a deal, right? So that's expected. Now, yeah. if you think that it's um, you don't want to, to come to terms with the negotiation, you follow the case, then the arbitration process, which is the one that comes after, that's the one where, as you say, the, uh, the the court is going to be looking at did you follow process which entails did you have meetings did you great give awareness where did you see the shortfall how did you address it what resources you give so the process uh, they gets looked at and based yeah. on that process being followed or not is where you're going to get a uh, you know what's what's the finding so it's important to differentiate the two i have not done arbitration processes and i do um you know the good thing there is that you can have a labor attorney representing you right while in the mediation you can't am i right uh no so it, it depends what the the the, the matter is about so you can request it um but for unfair dismissal it's not automatically guaranteed so it would be for a uh, constructive dismissal case, you allowed it. So it, it all depends on the matter and then on the commissioner. The commissioner may allow legal representation from both sides. Um, he may reject it on both sides. So it all really just depends on the commissioner. Do they the tell matter. you in the moment, like you show up there and they tell you, sorry, no, I can't be here? <laughs> Which is why the, the pre-prep for the arbitration is key. And knowing mm -hmm. that you've got your ducks in a row, you put together a bundled pack, that explains a timeline of exactly what happened, what evidence was used to prove the misconduct, if it's a misconduct dismissal, or what are the minutes of a formal poor work performance notice was sent, were the rights there, were the right questions asked in terms of the preliminary steps in the, the poor yeah. work performance or in the hearing. Uh, yeah, was a finding made, was a finding fair and based on the evidence led? Um, and then looking at was aggra uh, aggravating and mitigating circumstances submitted in terms of the Sudumo case? Uh, was that taken into account when making a recommendation to the company? Did the company uh, or the chairperson apply their mind and were they, they fair and equitable in it? Mm. Yeah, and um, that is another piece of advice that uh, we, like that case, that bundle that you're talking about that you use in arbitration, 
I feel like it's such a good tool to use when you're doing your internal process. So when you're doing the, the meetings uh, related to counseling and, you know, you build your first, your second, if you already start building your case and you bring your bundle with, I think it's a psychological um, understanding of like, there's a case being built, there's proof being laid out. And that really helps for more satisfactory cases to resolve earlier on. So that case that you're using arbitration, actually you can start building it from when it's happening internally in the company. And I feel like it has this psychological effect that people go like, no, things are being followed and there's, there's a case being built. So they're yeah. more willing to, um, to want to come to terms with that, what, what's happening. And that takes me to separation agreements. And, you know, that's that's a it's a way to resolve a situation uh, before without following the full process, because you kind of already see it and uh, how it unfolds. But it's only a, a resource for the employee to use. So can you talk us a little bit about that separation agreements? Yeah. So effectively, I mean, for me, a separation agreement is skipping all the steps and jumping straight into conciliation almost. It's about saying there's clearly a misalignment. Um, you know, we can follow the process. Normally, it should come from the employee. An employer can can suggest it by saying, look, this is a road we're going down. Would you consider it? So it's purely up to the employee to accept. Because what it is, it's, it's any contract. It's a meeting of the minds. So what you do is you sit down and talk around it and say, we've got this reciprocal relationship that's created in the employment contract. We don't want it to exist anymore. So we want to nullify it. On what terms are we going to do so? Yes. How do we make it work for both parties? You know, are we going to give references? Are we going to pay you out? What's going to happen with leave? Are you going to work a notice period? And it's all about what the parties are willing to come to the table with. And in some, some cases, it might be that that process is initiated and an offer is put on the table by the company, and the employee says, no, I'm not, it's not what I'm willing to accept. I feel I deserve more. And if the company is not willing to offer more, then fine, let's, let's continue the process because we've tried to see if there's a, a reasonable solution. Um, and if the parties aren't meeting, then let's follow the process. And it might be the process is dismissal. It might be that actually we don't feel that this is, yeah, worthy of dismissal and an employee remains employed and yeah so so it goes yeah exactly um and i think that's the biggest piece of awareness when it comes to mutual separation agreements if you are introduced to one ever or if you as a company want to introduce one is that you expect negotiation there to happen so if you follow through a legal proceeding then what the person will get paid is what they're entitled to so work until the date you know that you're making the finding as well as do they have leave uh, owed to them and the statutorial stuff? But if you are in a mutual separation agreement, you can weigh in and say, look, for me to find a new job will take so long. So you can add weeks to that. So ex gratia payment. And, and that is maybe, you know, in your favor. So something to expect, again, is the negotiation if you are to be presented with a mutual separation agreement, which might be, you know, to your advantage, right? If you if you are willing to, yeah, to kind of like mutually separate yeah and and often yeah it, it's not for every situation some situations don't merit it but some of them you're saying like you committed a misconduct sure it was a mistake but it's severe enough that it's had massive impact or potentially massive impact in the company we need to take drastic action but we don't dislike you but we just you can't be in this role any longer mm. yeah to our mind so we will either follow the process and follow the recommendation or we can approach and say, this is an option if you're willing to consider it. You know, you may be liable for dismissal. It's not that you will be dismissed, um, but it's still very much, it's in its infancy. We believe yeah. this to be the case, but we're going to follow and trust that process. Yes, that's the other thing is that there's negotiation. And at the same time, if you rather save yourself from having to go through that legal process that's awaiting for you, you know, depending yeah. on what happens. Uh, mutual separation is what's going to make it resolve before you have to walk through that process. Because to me, you know, the, this thing around the, the dignity in the process, right, it's a big one. So you you have the right to say, listen, guys, le, le, we, we get it. Like I had a fraud case, which uh, the person, the 
employee was well versed in the legal framework, in the SA legal framework, and like they understood. Listen, I don't want to have to go through that. Let's just, I understand that this, there's no remedy here. Let's just mutually separate. And and yeah, that's that's how it kind of you you know that you're saving people's times and quite a not not the best process to go through. Look, I mean, you, you, the process I say trust it. It's never it's a simple process, but it's never a nice process. Yeah, because it's emotions and yeah. If you look at a poor work performance, you're saying you don't have capacity, you do not have the ability to work at the required level. That's not a nice thing to have to hear. Um, so it's always complex and it's not a nice thing to have to say. And I mean, that that boils down to same as a disciplinary hearing, you know, say they are found guilty of a misconduct. The first question asked is, yeah, how do you feel about the trust relationship between yourself and your employer? I mean, employee, uh, does it exist? Do you think, do you, do you foresee a future employment with them? And you're sitting across the table from the person looking at them and you need to be honest to say, I don't, I can't trust them. And that's not a nice thing to have to say to someone, but no. you've got to be honest in that process. Yeah, I, yeah, I hear you. And when we go through this process, I feel like everybody, when the process finishes, uh, you, you feel obviously like at, at peace because what had to happen happened and things were said so i feel like everybody grows from that process hopefully understanding and having more experience with what you know they go to next um and and now we're, we're kind of getting into that kind of the complexity of the cases i'd love to hear from you if you can give us ideas of very complex cases that you've worked on and just a little bit of how how that can look like yeah so i mean look the complexity always changes i mean it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because you get some that are emotionally complex and don't feel good but it is the only outcome so for example i i was doing one there was a young employee who took outside work on a long weekend ended up in an accident uh became quadriplegic and now you've got to yeah Put him on temporary medical disability, you know, te temporarily incapacitate him while we find out what the full results of the tests are and operations are. And then ultimately, in that case, we ended up having to inc permanently incapacitate him. But you kind of got that next level of complexity that, well, we can medically board. And you can't medically board because it wasn't done during the course and scope of his employment, it was outside work and done through negligence. So he, couldn't claim um, and it doesn't feel right but that is what the law says is right horrible situation um, and, th and that then you know becomes complex because of the amount of human emotion that needs to be yeah. involved in that um, then you get other ones that are just downright bizarre to wrap your head around kind of being on mine sites obviously zero alcohol tolerance and people taking the shifts at late note is coming in failing the breathalyzer and saying it was because they ate bread um or someone disappearing for weeks no i was abducted by spirits and taken to malawi and mm. you kind of try to wrap your head around what exactly this is and how is this person trying to rationalize it so trying to understand the intent behind it all can become quite complex but then You've also got kind of much more complex ones like fraud and senior management for multinationals uh, due to gambling addictions or drug and drink addictions. What does that look like? How does that impact the rest of senior management? Uh, also working for a Chapter 9 institution where a new CEO was brought on board to, to run it. Um, and she clashed heavily with the CFO uh, and the CTO, and it ended up being a big fight at board level um, that shareholders got involved with. And it was purely, there wasn't misconduct or anything, it was just misalignment of personality. So there's a complete clash of personality. So what do we do? You know, if we can't get an agreement in place, both parties are standing firm, there has to be an outcome because 
the institute had frankly ground to a halt and couldn't operate. Mm. Um, so then you've got to find mechanisms. Yeah. There are mechanisms and law and charges you can bring forward on that mm. basis, but it brings in a whole lot more complexity to it. Um, you've got you know, other complex ones can be cases of, of sexual harassment uh, mm. by men or women. Um, and especially those in senior positions need to be handled very, very carefully. And they are yeah. rife in the workplace. Because in that case, I mean, obviously the legal proceeding is quite straightforward, but having to face these people after what they've done, it's, it's you know, that's the complexity. And what no. all of these cases, what, what I see is that, you know, when we speak in HR about culture, like having a good culture, right? And sometimes it can become a little bit like, like, like you know, almost like a, something that it just gets taken for grant, granted. But when you have companies that these things are going through, you can only understand what what legacy, what culture, what environment they, they have. And you almost, you feel sorry for the entity, right? Because now like poor company, they have to deal with, with these really big things going on. And, and my biggest takeaway from what you're saying is that when you involve these processes from the very beginning and you know that you have objective and fair ways to go about them you are it's almost like an insurance to know that you're going to create a culture where people the basics dignity again it's it's in place right so so that to me like what an impact on culture can it have to have very fair and laid out processes from the word go and And again it goes to having those procedures so i mean the problem with the sexual harassment cases, they're not always easy to prove. Mm. Um, and they come with a whole lot of other complexities as, you know, did it happen outside work hours? Was it a perceived sexual harassment? Was it actual sexual harassment? Mm. What occurred? Do we have witnesses? Were, was drinking involved? Mm. Um, what are the equal statuses in terms of the company hierarchy? Where do they fit in? You know, is it a top down or bottom up or equal level? What does a company policy and procedures state? Has yeah. there been training on it? What level of employee are they entry level? You know, all of these things have to now be considered and weighed up and shown as evidence. And so that brings a level of complexity to it, especially as if there are witnesses, you're going to get different counts of the versions of the event, especially say it was at, at the, the office function and a suggestion was made or a lewd remark was directed and overheard and misinterpreted. There's, there's lots to take yeah. on board. And then you have to start unpacking it according yeah. to the policy, according to the law. Yeah, and because I think in that case, you have to deal with the, with the act, right? But And then the lay, the work environment. So there's almost yeah. like governing two different, uh, you know, things and uh, kind of aggravating, as you said, factors. Uh, like I also find that with fraud, where we have to deal with that, where we have to you we have to involve criminal court, and yeah. now you know how you from being a HR in house doing this proceed, how it all tied up to a criminal case, yeah. it can get it can get really nasty really quick. Uh, yeah. But it, uh, yeah, and and also in those instances, yeah, once that charge has been laid, it is out of the company's hands. You can't. Yeah. Say no, we're going to drop that. It's, it's a criminal matter. The state is running with it. If they deem yeah. there's a case, it, it's for the company. Um, and I mean, you talk about those those complexities, yeah, with fraud. I think fraud fraud's a particularly difficult one because, yeah, often it'll be a forensic audit. It's, it's a complete breach of trust. So in that sense, that becomes easier once all of that's done. But yeah, what effects does it have long term on the company? What effects does it have on the employee? All of these are are things. That I suppose you you have to consider kind yeah. of other areas of complexity that come in um, largely come in in terms of if you're doing an incapacity uh, and it's a medical condition you have to now understand you know, get professional opinion and especially in in areas of of mental health about saying okay what does it look like you know we're not a professional and it impacts and lands and everyone differently so you've got to get that professional report and opinion and then say okay can we now adjust the role how is that going to impact the person so it's very much a, you've got to feel out what the right solution is yeah. 
I hear you. Uh, mental illness, yeah, those are the most challenging for me. I feel like you, and I'm, because my background is psychology, like you can't, you understand a little bit of what has happened for the person to be acting out the way they're, they're doing so, but you you are in a work environment and, and you know, you there's a business case that needs to happen. So if this mental illness is in, in, in the way of for that person to be able to pull their way forward, you have to address it. But then to what point it's like about the work and to what points about the livelihood, right? And so there's many things to consider. You feel deeply sorry for what the person is experiencing, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, there's also that kind of responsibility that as a citizen, right? Like you need to have, like I also find that recently came across, it wasn't related to the HR work, but was more migration, like, uh, someone from a different country being in South Africa and, and having like severe mental illness acting out. And then what court do you, because, you know, in South Africa, this person without insurance and, you know, maybe uh, going to the police, how to deal with those cases can become really complex. I find it to what you were saying when last year with, we dealt with a big fraud case and also mental illness. When I'm involved in these cases, you start experiencing like that environment that they create. So for fraud, we we had the, as you said, the forensic audit happening with a big a law firm. And you all of a sudden it's like, what, 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 what am I saying? And you start, you know, like feeling that, that really big weight on your shoulders of what someone else that has nothing to do with you, but you're some, somehow wanting to help or part of the case. And with mental illness, when the person in front of you, like we had, you know, like, as you said, uh, I've been abducted by aliens, I'm taken to Malawi. When you have someone experiencing that in front of you, you you get into, you know, emotionally what it feels to having these deliriums and then you're trying to do work, but how do you tell the person, you know, where do you draw the line? So those cases really, it impacts your whole life when you, and maybe I'm too emotional, maybe you're different, obviously you come from the... No. From the yeah, yeah. I think from my side, you, you you have to take out the motion largely. But yeah, saying that, so thankfully it, it wasn't the aliens, but I mean, if, if it was, for example, um, and you see a person having that psychotic break and yeah, in that proceeding, then maybe it's time to say, you know, that's where we get more of a legal complexity coming in. Most of it's an emotional complexity. But yeah, there we've got the legal complexity that the person's clearly having a psychotic break and this is the ill health. Is actually causing the misconduct. We need to stop the disciplinary process for now. Get a report. So yeah, then we start the process, and that then creates another level of complexity that you're running two processes simultaneously. That you have got a misconduct which you put in abeyance because actually we need to deal with the incapacity hearing. Um, yeah. And the incapacity hearing then is we got to wait for a report, judge whether or not this break has is what led to the misconduct being committed in the first place or if they're completely separate then you can continue with the, the disciplinary process rather than the ill health yeah. reach the conclusion and you know what i found really interesting we had one of those cases where we had to recourse to to incapacity and we waited for the prognosis from the um psychiatrist and the prognosis was like extremely hopeful like there was almost like not seeing how this will impact the actual performance and outcome of the work and what i felt was as a professional you're telling this person can perform work and so you're valuing the fact that this person needs to get a salary to leave but what about the actual mental health because you could tell the environment this person was working in was an, a trigger for that person yeah. like the person needed to get out of work and just get treatment and you know get and, and then you had this prognosis where you go like, how can a psychiatrist not be seeing the fact that this person cannot work? I found that so, you know, interesting. And I think with mental illness, there's there's a lot, um, maybe because there's a stigma around it or that we don't unpack. Like people don't tell you at, um, you know, at work, it's, it doesn't get disclosed. You usually come across it later on at work. Like people don't disclose that as a disability. And it's a really interesting one. Yeah, look, it is. And I think it's twofold. You know, there, there's that stigma attached to it. Um, but there's also that complexity, you know, complexity and, you know, 
not being a professional in the area, you, you mentioned that that particular instance. And the problem is, is you have to take that report on face value because that is a professional evaluation that you rely on. Um, so even if we think it's happening, what you can do is take a, a softer approach and say, we feel that this report is not accurately portraying it. How do you feel? But if the person stands, yeah, the, the employee stands by the report that was given and said, no, it's fine, then you have to go with it. Or yes. the instances where you can see they're having yeah, some form of trigger or, or emotional response to it, and they're not willing to bring it to the table, um, then it can't be considered. We can't use that as an excuse then for the behavior because you are not willing to bring it to the table. We've offered it to you as an option. But if yeah. you refuse it, then we have to follow the other processes we can. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that case. What happened was that the the person, you know, like when, when you have, um, I don't know exactly what the diagnosis was, but I could tell I was, the person could reason right with me. So it was like, look, this is what we're seeing. And it means that you would stay. But what I can see is that this work environment is triggering you. So it ended up in a mutual separation agreement because I was speaking to, to uh, in that state of health that that person yeah. could be in at that moment and come to terms with that person to be like, this is not going to work out for you. You really need to focus on your mental health. And then it ended up like that. So to me, that was the best outcome because I could really tell this person could not focus on work. They had to focus on themselves. So, so yeah, those are some of the complex cases that we've dealt with. And I must say that, um, you know, I, I am a very like emotionally attached person to these things. And to me, it drains me. Like I, every night, if I'm dealing with a case, I go to bed and I'm always thinking about the case, how we will progress, what's going on. When I dismiss people, I always think how, what's next for them. And, and it's difficult. It's really difficult. So I know that having you as a labor attorney, that will tell me exactly, you know, what the law, the stance that we need to take. Mm. It's the most reassuring thing uh, to do. And obviously, we're a consultancy, so we liaise with a lot of clients, with a lot of cases. It might be different when you're a business owner and then you have the odd case here and there. But the advice of, like, involve HR from the word go and work as a team together to solve what you have in front of you. Don't let just, like, do a blind eye because it's going to, you know, blow uh, uh, yeah, It'll just keep getting worse, unfortunately. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Tim. It was lovely to just tell a little bit of, uh, you know, the things that we work on, which to me is the most, you know, as I said, it's draining, but it is the most rewarding work that we do because yeah. it's, it, there's hard outcomes. And I feel like that in the HR field, you really need to focus on, on getting hard outcomes because otherwise everything stays in a bit of a flat, flat or abstract. You know, when I say create culture and all of that, this is what it means to create a good culture. This is exactly... Yeah. Look, yeah. I mean, you, you can't have a good culture with negativity in it. And that's part of the problem is that sometimes you have to have that hard process and go through the hard processes for the betterment of the company and, and, and the betterment of the rest of the team. That ignoring it's not going to go away and the impact of employees or the fellow employees is also going to be key. You know, if the one person leaves or arrives an hour late every single day, what is the rest of the team thinking? And are they going to start arriving late? So you start, they see it, it creates resentment and unhappiness and unease. And yes. yeah, and that that then starts going down that, that toxic slippery slope in terms of organizational happiness. So yeah. in order to, to keep it, you have to have that hard conversation with that person and try to yeah. get them to align or to move them on if they're not going to align. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And there's that concept in psychology called collective unconscious. And what it means is that, you know, when you arrive in a company, you, you feel the tone. You know if people are able to be themselves and with, you know, focus and all, or if something is off, right? And that off is these things, is the unsets, is that there was a proceeding, we don't know what happened, the person left, nobody heard. When you deal with things like that, it creates a bad culture and it, yeah. it becomes an imprint in the way you go about business. You don't want that. You want to be as transparent and fair and objective as possible. And this is the way to do it. It's it, This is much more important than your team building activity where you took your team to a retreat, you know, for a massage on a quarterly basis. Yeah. That that will 
you know, if you have this going on and that's how you're dealing with your culture, it's it's weird. It's almost like but worse, I would say. Rather, it, a, it, it creates a, a culture of fear and uncertainty, really. Yeah. Um, because we're getting rewarded, but bad things are happening. You're kind of not quite sure where you stand in anything. And, and everyone then starts tiptoeing about rather than saying, look, these are our rules. These are policies and procedures. This is how we operate. We want you to be part of the company and want you on board with it. And this is how we manage it. Um, so there are no, you know, there, there's less of the gray areas. It's much more just clear cut, delineated. And then the massages or going to a spa or a retreat have a positive impact rather than a potentially negative one. Yeah, 100%. Cool. Thank you so yeah. much. It was great Perfect. to unpack that. Yeah, uh, really good, good to catch up. Yeah. And thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Same yeah. to you, Dean. Bye. Bye.